Well, good morning. Good morning. It's a blessing to be here this morning. See a lot of familiar faces. Uh, my name is uh, Lewis Miller, and I am from originally York, Pennsylvania. And I was going to start out by saying I had a lot of respect for your preacher, but he invited a Yankee into your pulpit. So <laughs> I have to re reevaluate that. My wife is from Dodge County. She's born and raised at, uh, Ch in Chauncey. And I got married at Chauncey Baptist Church back in 1996. So uh, I praise the Lord. I didn't lose nothing up north, and I'm glad to be here in the south and uh, just thankful to be here this morning. Wanted to share from God's word about taking care of the orphan and then talk a little bit about uh, what our agency is trying to do to that end. My brother is speaking for me this morning at Grace, so you all pray for the members of Grace Baptist Church. I pick on him. He's a hospice chaplain. He works for Integrity Hospice. He's been ordained in the ministry, and uh, every time somebody preaches in your pulpit, Brother Chad will tell you, you got to go behind him and sweep up a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So I'm going to try to be careful this morning, brother. If you will, turn in your copy of God's Word to Exodus Chapter number 22. Exodus chapter number 22. I believe we have a slide for that. There we go. Verses 22 and 23. Verse 22 says, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And I normally don't look at verse 24, but I will this morning. And my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Let's pray this morning. Father, what a strong word. Help us, Lord, to consider in our hearts this morning who is the widow and who is the orphan. And Lord, are we, as your people, the people of God, Allowing them to be mistreated. Help us, Father, to see this and more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You study out this passage, you'll know that it says, if you allow, that's the intention of the passage here, if you allow mistreatment. I don't believe there's anybody in this building, anybody that would hurt a child, but this passage is talking about if you allow mistreatment to come upon a child. I want us to turn to a very familiar passage in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. You all know it very well. The passage that talks about the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. And with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That's the question I want to ask you folks this morning here at Cottondale Baptist Church. Who is your neighbor? Are we allowing as a people, as Christians, mistreatment to come upon the widow, 
to come upon the orphan. This young man, if he were living in our day, would probably be a good upstanding member of any Baptist church. He'd be a good citizen. He'd be a conservative evangelical. He would vote the right way. He would do all the right things. would probably even bring a good banana pudding casserole or dish to his Sunday dinner. And he's wanting to test himself to the master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He wants to check all the right boxes. And I love this about Jesus. Jesus says, how do you interpret the scripture? How do you read it? And the man quotes what he learned. Shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then the man begins to back up a little bit, backpedals and says, who is my neighbor? Sometimes it's frustrating when you read God's word and you want Jesus to answer a question directly and he tells a story. I got a mentor like that that lives in Atlanta. We lived in Atlanta about 10 years before moving down here in 2006, lived in the, the big thriving city of Rhine. And uh, we lived right on the corner there, that big white house that they moved. And uh, Brother Carter over there, he's buying up. He'll own all but about 10% of Dodge County here if we ain't careful. Good friend of mine, Brother Carter, loving the death. But this man, that's my mentor in Atlanta, he's, every time you ask him a question, being a younger pastor, I ask him a question, and he would not give me a straight answer. That's what Jesus does here. Listen to what he said. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And literally in the Greek, out of compassion. Out of compassion. Verse 34, we went to him. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And then Jesus asked the man the question, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers. Which of these three men proved? You know, as Baptists, we know all the right answers. I didn't grow up in a Baptist church. My mother was a non-practicing Catholic. My father, on his best day, was an agnostic. And there was one church in my neighborhood. It was a Presbyterian church. And because my maternal grandmother put pressure on my mother, you need to get those boys in church. They sent us to this Presbyterian church. So I didn't grow up going to church. And since we got old enough to protest, we stopped going to that Presbyterian church. I didn't get saved. I was 25 years of age. Got saved coming out of the Marine Corps. There is a truth. There is no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. And being in Iraq in 91, I figured that out myself. When you realize, hey, I could die out here, 30 miles from Baghdad. I could die out here. And you start to question things. But it took me five years from that point to receive Jesus into my heart. Which of these proved we know the right things as Baptists? We learn the right things in Sunday school. We are taught the right things, but which of these three proved to be? You see, this priest and this Levite, they were going home 
And by my calculations, it's about 15 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem, or Jerusalem down to Jericho. And you're going about 1,200 feet above sea level downhill. So these men were ministering. They were faithful. They were the conservative evangelicals, as it were, in our day. This could have been the pastor. This could have been the Sunday school teacher. This could have been the chairman of deacons. And they saw this man that the Bible says was half dead. And you know the history of the Samaritan people. They at one time uh, were Jewish themselves, and they intermarried, and the faith became uh, watered down as a result of that. And the Jewish people ended up despising the Samaritans. But this man is called a good Samaritan for what he proved to do. But the text says that this priest saw him and passed by on the other side. That word saw is a very interesting word. It means he closely inspected. So Brother Chad here was the man that is half dead. And he was on vacation, so he may very well be. <laughs> that priest saw him. That means he inspected him. He was aware of what he was wearing. And in this case, what that man was not wearing. I think we have a picture there of the... There, there's a, probably what the man might have looked like. So this man was half dead, and he noticed everything about him. But he walked by on the other side. He was aware of where he was, but got as far away. If I could slip behind this, I would. Since uh, January 1st, I've been off sugar and caffeine. So if I'm a little irritable <laughs> afterwards, you don't know why, but... He got as far away as he could because he didn't want to get too close to the problem. We're good at that as Baptists, aren't we? We're good at throwing money in the plate. We're good at praying for a cause. But when we need boots on the ground, right? A Marine, they, they say we're the first in and the last out. First in and last out. We need boots on the ground. Think about the president of the United States, right? If he has an ambassador to Israel, right? There's boots on the ground. He has a bunch of advisors in his cabinet. He can know everything there is to know about Israel. But he needs to have somebody on the ground that they can call, hey, what's the climate like? What's the temperature like? What's going on in the street over there? And this priest is like you and me at 12 o'clock. Man, when the service is over, we're making a beeline, the sidetrack. We're making a beeline going home to whatever your wife has in the crock pot. Whatever the case. This man's been ministering. He's faithful. He's a priest. He's been serving in the temple. And yet he didn't want to get too close because he might then have to get involved. And then the Levite, this tribe that's been set apart to minister in the name of the Lord. He did the same thing. We have a, another slide, brother. And I believe in my sanctified imagination, the text doesn't tell us this, but they're thinking, what's going to happen to me if I stop and help this man? What's going to happen to me? And isn't that what happens in our lives? What's going to happen to me if I bring a foster child into my home? I have three children, biologically. Two of them are in college. One is getting married next month. And I can't wait to get her off the payroll, let me tell you. <laughs> She's getting married February the 8th, February the 9th. I told her I'm sending you an envelope. It'll be there waiting on you when you get back from your honeymoon. It's going to have an insurance bill. It's going to have a phone bill. And whatever else bills. Isn't that what a wedding's about, by the way, when that man, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Right, that's what daddy's saying. I've been paying for her for 22 years. <laughs> and now it's your turn. Got a son that's in college, and I got a little 15-year-old that's a freshman in high school. We've had five foster kids come through our home so far. The first week that we had foster kids in our home, my daughter, who's now 15, she was 13. 
And I'm, my wife happened to be sick that weekend. And we got three foster kids in the house, and one's an infant. And perfect timing for my wife to be sick. And I'm sitting up in the middle of the night feeding this little girl who was born addicted to five different street drugs. And she's jittery, and she's not sleeping, and she's just irritable. And I'm feeding her, and I'm thinking, man, it's been 13 years since I did this. 13 years since I changed a diaper. What's going to happen to me? Our daughter didn't like it. And she was used to being the youngest, and now she's got three other different children in the home. We think about those kind of things. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family if we do this? You know, the number one question we... We've been, uh, I've been leading uh, Families for Families. We're a nonprofit foster care uh, agency. Did you know that 52% of every person that has a foster child in the state of Georgia, 52% of them, of those kids are managed by a foster care agency. So the kids are still in DFAC's custody. So if there's a child that's been neglected or abused and DFACS removes that child from the home, you can either be managed by DFACS, which is the state, or there's foster care agencies like mine. We're the only one in this, in this area, what's called Region 9, according to the DFACS uh, map. There is another map on there. Let me back up. Back up another one there, brother. There's a map. There we go. See that big red 44? That's what's called Region 9. That's all the counties that are in Region 9. That's all the counties that we cover. And we try to stay more locally where you see the numbers. That's the number of kids that are in foster care. 44 kids in Dodge County. I still live in Lawrence County. There's 122 in Lawrence County. The problem is there's only a handful of foster homes to place these children in. So those 44 kids that are in Dodge County, only three or four of them are currently in Dodge County. The other 40 or 41 could be anywhere in the state, wherever there is a home. So you think about a young child that's being neglected or abused and they're taken out of their home. Well, to a child that's being abused or neglected, the only stability they have in their life sometimes is school where they have consistency. They're able to eat a meal. They're able to have a structure. They're not being hurt. Well, these kids, because there's no open homes in Dodge County, now they're being pulled out of their school system in the middle of that. And that's traumatizing as well. So we want to put children from Dodge County into Dodge County homes. We don't hang a sign out in the community. You won't see a sign or a little thing in somebody's yard that says Families for Families. You won't see a billboard. You won't see a car going down the street that has a Families for Families logo on it because we just recruit in the local church. For two years, I pastored a church in Lawrence County for about 12 years. In October of 2017, the Lord led me away from there to focus on this agency. And from that time, uh, October of 2017 to now, I've spoken at over 50 churches, 50 Baptist churches, and about five or six Pentecostal, maybe three or four Methodist churches. So about 60 churches. You know the number one thing we hear? I would love to foster, but I just don't know if I could take a child in my home and then that child has to go back to their parents. I just don't know if I could handle that. That's the number one response that we hear. I'm going to talk to you plainly because you're, you're home town folks. And I know Brother Chad and I know his heart and I'm a big fan of his. By the way, y'all are blessed to have a pastor like him. And just parenthetically while I'm on that subject, Pray for his wife and love his wife. I got a pastor friend of mine that resigned at the church after five years because the congregation didn't even know his wife's first name. Can you believe that? 
In the Marines, they used to say, you think it's tough being a, pa- uh, being a Marine? Try being a Marine's why? You think it's tough being a pastor? Try being a pastor's why? So pray for his, his wife. Love on his, his wife. Don't walk right past his wife and smile and shake his hand and leave her standing there. Right? Everybody wants to talk to the pastor. Nobody wants to talk to the pastor's wife. Love on his wife. Now I forgot what I was talking about. What was I talking about? These kids that are in foster care, the number one reason, I I just don't know what's going to happen to me. I would just break my heart to send these kids back home. I want to tell the people, do you know how selfish that is? It's not about you. Now we're back to what the Samaritan, the priest and the Levite said. What's going to happen to me? There was a slide. Go ahead, brother. There was a slide that talked about how many kids are in foster care. 14,000 plus kids in the state of Georgia. My wife's mother, when we started this, she called my wife and said, I just saw on the news there's over 500 kids in the state of Georgia in foster care. My wife said, Mama, that's 14,000 in the state. If every church, if there's one family in every Baptist church in the state, we could eliminate the need for foster care in the state of Georgia. If one family in a Baptist church brought a child in their home, it would eliminate the need for foster care. But like me, I'm sitting there holding the baby. I ain't done this in 13 years. My wife was kind of fully not on board initially. I'm... Don't know if I want to go back to changing diapers. We got them. They can dress themselves. They can feed themselves. We're done with all that. Don't know if we can do that. We're not as young as we used to be. I'm sliding into 50 real fast and real hard. Not as easy as it once was. But instead of thinking, what's going to happen to me if I don't stop and help? Go to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. You was probably right the first time. What will happen to this man if I don't stop and help? That's what the Samaritan said. And the same word is used in the Bible. He saw the man that was half dead. But instead of saying, what's going to happen to me if I stop and help? What's going to happen to this man if I don't? What's going to happen to these foster kids if I don't? That's what Exodus 22 is talking about. If you allow affliction... See, we think that, hey, I'm going to church, and and I'm loving the Lord, and I'm a good citizen. We don't think that we're allowing affliction. You know, one thing that has categorized the church for the last 2,000 years, we can't walk past suffering and not be impacted. When they would close the gates at nighttime, there were Christians that would go out of the gate, and they would look around for babies that had been left, orphans that had been left. Christians can't walk past suffering and not be affected. That's why the priest and the Levite, they were in a hurry. I see the problem, but I don't want to get too involved with it. You ever been to a church where they, there was somebody in the church that had a, a youngin that had autism or Asperger's disease or spinal bifida? The church is behind that family. They're up close and personal. They see that child. They see that family. And they support that family. But we want to put blinders on. I don't want to see those 14,000 kids in the state. I don't want to see those 44 kids in Lawrence County, uh, in Dodge County. I want to go by on the other side. Can I ask you a question this morning? Do you know the name were names of any foster child. If we don't know their names, how can we get involved in their life? But you know what? If guilt, my wife asked me the other day, she said, did they teach you how to induce guilt in seminary? (laughs) Last week, as a matter of fact, Sunday evening service, 
time to go to service. It takes us, my house is 23 miles from Grace Baptist Church. It takes about 30 minutes to drive the distance. My wife is driving. It takes about 20 minutes. But, <laughs> and she's not here today, so I'm going to talk about her. I got dressed and told the kids to get ready. And she said, I'm just not feeling well. Don't know if I'm going to go to evening service. And I told her, I looked at her, and I said, you know, I love you, right? She says, yeah. I says, but one thing I learned in the ministry, you can't force people to love Jesus. And I went and got ready. She came in the bathroom about five minutes later. <laughs> Did they teach you how to induce guilt in the seminary? And I just kind of snickered on the inside. But you know what? If I could come here and make everybody feel guilty, that's, that wouldn't last. That's not what it's about. Because at 3 o'clock in the morning when that little baby's crying, if I can talk you into something, you're going to be you talked out of it right by that spouse. I knew we should have never got involved with that guy. He come there talking big, but where is he at now? But I want to show you in the text Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And that's literally out of compassion. If you're going to do something, and if I'm going to do something, it's going to be out of the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the story in the scripture where Jesus fed 5,000 men? Well, these men had wives and children. There's probably 14,000, 15,000 people there. But they had just a little Hebrew Happy Meal, right? A couple barley loaves and some fish, some minners, right? I'm learning the language here, by the way. (laughs) So this boy's little Hebrew Happy Meal that his mama packed for him, that was just enough for him, Jesus says, give it here. That's what we have, right? I run out of compassion. I run out of patience. I run out of love. But when I know that my basket's empty, these 12 disciples, the first person that they fed, it was divided by 12. The first people in their life, the first 12 people they fed weren't getting enough. And they were out. But they reached into that basket and they pulled out something that Jesus put in there. You know what? I'm at my best when I'm at my most empty. Lewis Miller at his best can never do anything. I'm still paying at the age of 49. I'm still paying for my best thinking. Where my best thinking got me. I'm still paying for those sins. But at my best is when I'm most surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I run out of patience with my wife or with somebody in the church or whatever the case, I reach in there and pull out. Jesus is the spiritual Costco, right? He has an abundance. He never runs out. I can love my wife more because my number one love is the Lord Jesus Christ. And she's glad that it is because she saw what Lewis Miller had to offer. My wife married a lost man, by the way. I didn't get saved about seven months into our marriage. When I got saved, I got so mad at her. You not only married a Yankee, but you married a lost man. (laughs) If there's a kid here, children here, teenagers here, don't do that. Don't be unequally yoked. That's the exception, not the rule. I got friends that are still waiting for their spouse to come to Christ after 30 plus years of marriage. She knows who Lewis was, how much love he had to offer, how much mercy he had to offer. And she knows that because Jesus is my first love, that now I can give her a never-ending supply of love. See, her knowing that I'm going to come home at night and be next to her and be there in the morning when she wakes up, my covenant when I got married was before the Lord. Doesn't matter how she acts towards me. It's based upon what I promised the Lord. It's out of his love that I'm going to love her. 
Love is doing what's in somebody's best interest. You know that. That's agape love. And the Samaritan, these busy, conservative, evangelicals, the priest and the Levite, the pastor and the Sunday school teacher, and yet this man that was a Samaritan that was despised by the Jew, he's the one that ended up helping this man. Our main branch of Families for Families is in Loganville in the Atlanta area. And the guy that started the agency is a former youth pastor. You know what he told me one time? He says, where are you speaking at, Lewis? I was speaking at a First Baptist church in another county. He said, that's going to be tough. Rich people don't foster. So what do you mean? That's the priest. That's the Levite. Too busy. The man that was used to being picked on, the man that was used to being nothing, the man that was used to being despised, he's the one that had a, had a heart. I'm a middle child. You know what happens to a middle child, right? I'm the classical middle child, right? Left in the middle, the odd man out, the black sheep of the family. I was abused and I was neglected as a child. My older brother, who's not a believer, was not. If you dropped on the floor right here and fell out with heart trouble, my brother would not walk over you. He'd check your pockets first. <laughs> That's my brother. He didn't experience what I experienced. But you know, the deeper that that blade is like a plow, right? If you're plowing a hard ground, it just skips over the ground. But if you're plowing a ground that's tender, it cuts. The deeper you've been cut in your life, that's the deeper the word and the spirit of God can go in there and something can come out of that. And the Samaritan, out of that fertile ground, out of that compassion that comes to relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one that helped the man. And that rich young ruler, that young Pharisee, he thought he had all the boxes checked, but he didn't have that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he could say the right answer according to Scripture, but Jesus wanted to see where he was. You tell me who's your neighbor. That's the, that's the area that he had questions on. I'm supposed to love? I'm supposed to take this Baptist knowledge and I'm supposed to take it outside of these church walls? Who's my neighbor? People that look like me, act like me, talk like me, smell like me, walk like me? Jesus says, you tell me. Which one proved to be the neighbor. Well, I'm going to close with this thought. Um, if you can go to the next slide, there's a couple of pictures of some children here. This little baby, I sat with this baby at Fairview Park Hospital over Christmas. Got up, uh, we had our Christmas early in our family, we get up at five o'clock and we have a birthday cake and we sing happy birthday to Jesus and we read the Christmas story and we open presents and then kids opened up the presents. I went to Fairview Park so this foster mom could go home with the three foster, other foster kids she had and her two biological kids. This is number six. She took in four foster kids born addicted to all these different street drugs. So we have volunteers, right, from churches like this. Hey, I know you're not called to foster, but I can spend a four-hour shift at a hospital hugging on a baby, loving on a baby. These two uh, Latino girls here they're placed in Wheeler County. They look like the kind of kids that we see when we go to Africa. Mother herself is in foster care, or was married to an illegal who just got deported, can't take care, doesn't know how to take care of these babies. She can barely take care of herself. She was in foster care herself. I get calls every day of the week, Monday through Friday, sometimes on Saturday and Sunday. I got a call on the way here this morning from a county, Cobb County. I got a 16-year-old girl that needs to be placed in foster care and her two-week-old daughter who's also in foster care, right? So one of the kids that we brought in our home, he was 11 years old, and the mother had five children, all to a different father. And we got the 11-year-old and the 2-year-old that came to our home. 
11 year old, two year old. Well, the boyfriend was the father of the two year old. So he used to hold the 11 year old down who wasn't his son and allow the two year old to urinate in the 11 year old's face. And he'd make the 11 year old do all the chores. So the 11 year old's washing dishes. You know how the, the sink looks? Right, guys, I know guys in here do dishes, right? You know how the sink looks when you're done doing the dishes and the water's just nasty? He'd come by the 11 year old to make him do the dishes and push his head down under that nasty, grimy water and hold it there to the point where he'd not be turning blue and then pull him up. That's the kind of neglect and abuse that we're dealing with. So, families for families, right? We recruit families. We want to partner with churches like this, right? You already have a nursery. You already have Sunday school rooms. Maybe you can do a date night for the foster families where you can watch their biological kids and their foster kids while the parents get some time off, right? We need families uh, from churches like this to take the families here in Dodge County that are fostering with us meals. What if you had a Sunday school class or the WMU or the men's group Right? They say, we want to take this foster family a meal once a week for six months. So that family, when they come home, right? one of the families here in Dodge County, they're working. They're both working. They got two little girls and they got two biological kids. They both come home from work to know that either Tuesday or Thursday, somebody's bringing them a meal once a week. That's a blessing to a family. We got babies that always need diapers. We're trying to work with the school system, right? First grade, bring in size one diapers. Second grade, bring in size two diapers. Right? We need churches to be able to do that. During VBSs, right? Hey, let's, let's, let's raise money to get diapers. There's a constant financial need, right? We're a nonprofit organization. For us to train one family, it costs us anywhere between $1,200 and $1,500 to get that family trained. We do 24 hours. Every foster family is 24 hours of training. We do the training for that. We have a caseworker uh, that goes out to the home. In addition to the DFACS caseworker, it's a Families for Families caseworker that goes out. We got to pay somebody to do a home study, contract that out. So if we have churches that say, you know what, I'm going to give $100 a month for a year. That trains one new family that year. So the point is, there's a lot of different ways you can help. But I want you to pray about it. We don't have the, this in uh, our area yet, but the oldest person in Families for Families is in Loganville. 74-year-old man is fostering. His wife died three years ago. And with the help of his church, he's fostering a little four-year-old, 72-year-old man. If you still have air in your lungs... God can still use you. So I don't know what God has in store for Cottondale Baptist Church. But I appreciate the opportunity, brother, to come and present the need. I'm going to turn it back to you, brother. I'll be in the back with some pamphlets and a clipboard. If you go to that, there you go. January the 19th, we'll be back for what's called an information session. Right? We're not arm twisters. If you come to the meeting on the 19th, we're not going to sign you up and now you're bringing, we're not going to bring foster kids to that meeting. Here you go. All right, but that's come to get more information. Hey, I'm in the WMU and we want to we wanna help. Or, all right, yeah, I might be interested in fostering. How can we help? Every foster family per child, you get about $750 from the state per month uh, to foster. That money goes toward food running the dryer, household expenses, right, for, for that support. So, hey, I want to learn more about it. We want to see how we can help as a church. We'll be back right here January the 19th before your evening service. Thank you.